uh, the administration of the university ever since I've been here, and that's been for several decades, uh, always to end up uh, making, making all the decisions. Um, it's very seldom that um, governing council is supposed to be a representative body functions the way they're supposed to function. I think that it's, this is large though it is, I think that the University of Toronto is still small enough that you could have uh, it could, it, it's, its core democratic uh, mode of organization could be uh, participatory and, and should be. And certainly when you get down into, into neighborhoods, a lot of what goes on in cities too is done through participatory democracy. Uh, I came I was feared I'd be late because I was at a meeting of our neighborhood association which was involved in this kind of endeavor right now. Well, what is required for parliamentary democracy where it is appropriate, or for parliamentarianism where it is appropriate? What is required for it to function? I think that there are three uh, core preconditions. The first is that it must be responsible. And what I mean by responsible is that members of parliament need to, without putting too fine a point on it, act with some semblance, not semblance, really be motivated by morality. There has to be a sense that morality has a place in politics. For the Schumpeterians that I referred to, the, these, the thin concept, they were, they were against an, any morality being involved in the government. It just didn't belong. Morality belonged in the, in the, uh, private, in the private sphere. Uh, for parliamentary government to work, members of parliament and the government need to be responsible. They need to be moral, and this means that they have to look to the public good. Um, Aristotle defined a citizen as someone who is capable of governing and being governed with an eye to virtue. And I think that that's accurate. Now, it has puzzled me, if I can just dwell on this for a moment, how it is that people like Stephen Harper and the, the political theorists, some of whom are in, in, in my department that support him, few now, actually, the main ones have left. Uh, there are some. Um, and uh, people like him, how, how they can embrace both market-oriented neoliberal policies and also social conservatism. It has puzzled me how these things, two things come together. Do people here recognize the name William Crystal? William Crystal is the uh, editor of the Washington Standard, and he's a leading think tank, uh, leader of the, the right-wing think tank in the United States. Um, when our president, Rob Pritchard, uh, was, uh, uh, Rob Pritchard, shortly before he became president of the uh, University of Toronto, uh, was very active in the Liberal Party, he still is, and he was, I think he was the fundraiser or campaign manager in one of the high-profile uh, uh, political campaigns. Then, to his shock and dismay, we get this, uh, we get the Harris government in Ontario. And so Pritchard began to worry that, uh, you know, he was, they were going to take retribution against him for being a high profile liberal, as indeed they did. Uh, 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 the uh, Harris folk were, were, were very mean and vindictive. Um, so he wanted to cover his right flank, and he did it by uh, using a, a scholarship that would bring, or some speakership that would bring high profile speakers to the campus, and he brought William Crystal. Um, Crystal was supposed to give talks, and among other things, he was supposed to give guest, make guest appearances in people's classes. Most of my colleagues said, no way, we don't want this right wing any longer in our class. I jumped at it. I was teaching a course in democratic theory, I thought, what better? Plus, I knew my students. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, we, so we had Crystal come in, and he's, he was, he's urbane, and he was trying to, you know, um, be conciliatory, but, but with extreme effort. Uh, nobody was buying it when we went after him. Student after student came at him on the same question. How can you, uh, William Crystal, a secular uh, East Coast Jewish intellectual, 
how can you throw in your lot? We understand you believe in the neoliberal market economics. We understand that. But how can you throw in your lot with these social conservatives? Let's face it, they're, they uh, don't think that things secular are good, and they would have you burn at a stake if they could. Uh, their, their record on, with, with regards to anti-Semitism has not been exactly sterling, and so on. So they don't like the East Coast either, uh, and they're anti-intellectual. So I mean, you, this, they're not your folk. How can you accommodate this? He had no answer to that question. He mumbled something about, well, you know, freedom and equality are always a trade-off. <laughs> right, well, what, so what? Um, I think I now actually do, however, understand it. And it's against this background of, of responsibility. For, for parliament or government or governance generally, well, we're talking about government now, formal government, not governance. For government to be responsible is for it to play an active role in society. And this is the thing that both the neoliberals and the social conservatives reject. They don't like government. They don't think that government should play a role in society except in, in the thinnest of regulations. Um, the neoliberals think that they should stay out of especially the economy and let market, and they think everything is a, is a market. Marriage is a market relationship and everything else. So they, that, that the government should stay out of that and just let the market, you know, let the market function and whatever comes out of it comes out of it. The social conservatives um, don't agree with the neoliberals on, on their, on their market-oriented amorality. Uh, but th uh, they think that, mo that moral behavior and looking out for common interests should be entirely rele relegated to the private domain. Um, and typically that means for them the family. That's where it should take place. There shouldn't, we shouldn't go beyond this. If government and parliament are irresponsible, if they give up on morality and responsibility and looking to the public good, then I believe that this is a uh, something that is going to threaten the functioning of parliamentary democracy severely. So that's one precondition, is responsibility. A second one is responsiveness. That uh, in order for parliamentary parliamentarianism to resolve or make progress toward resolving this problem in democracy that I started with, uh, in addition to being responsible, parliaments have to be responsive. They have to listen to actual people. Um, they need to be, some, some members of parliament actually are, you see them in between elections uh, in, your, in your wards or, or writings. Uh, most of them you do not. They show up. Um, Olivia Child, to her, to, uh, her great credit, is quite visible in, in the writing that we're in. Uh, so she's around. She has a newsletter. She sends it out. She comes. You may dislike her or like her. It doesn't matter. But she certainly tries to be responsive. She was preceded by a man named Tony Iano. No one ever saw him. Not ever. Except sometimes he would knock on your door around election time. Uh, but that was irresponsible. He was not being responsive. He was not responding to the people. Being responsive also means not imputing to the public the motives that you claim they have. Uh, you're not responsive to a people when you tell them what they think. And that's what Harper was doing when he was telling Canadians that they don't care about prorogation or about parliament. Uh, what they care about are jobs and the Olympics. I think that that was what triggered the backlash against him, the popular backlash. 